This is GoPowerCat.com publisher Tim Fitzgerald. Thank you for listening to this PowerCat podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode of the PowerCat podcast by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, or your favorite podcast network. And if you enjoy this podcast, please consider becoming a subscriber to GoPowerCat.com. We cover the Wildcats like no one else with our VIP customers enjoying one-of-a-kind coverage from our team of professional journalists. And sign up today for an annual subscription to GPC and grab a 30% discount on your first year. And now here's the PowerCat Podcast. The following is a GoPowerCat.com and Spirit Street production. You've discovered your link to GoPowerCat.com's PowerCat pregame podcast, presented by Robbins Motor Company, and it starts right now. Now, let's go to the WTC Gig Powered Studios. Here's your host, GoPowerCat.com publisher, Tim Fitzgerald. Following a 52-0 shutout of Bowling Green, K-State will hit the road for the first time in 2019 as the Wildcats travel to Starkville to face 23rd-ranked Mississippi State on Saturday. The game is scheduled for an 11 a.m. kick and will be shown nationally on ESPN right after college game day. The game can also be heard across the 39 station K-State Sports Network with Wyatt Thompson on play-by-play, former K-State quarterback Stan Weber providing analysis, and our buddy Matt Walters on the sideline and on the pre- and post-game shows. K-State opened the Chris Kleiman era with two convincing victories, including a 49-14 victory over Nichols to open the season, and then the shutout of Bowling Green. The Wildcats rushed for 694 yards in their first two games, the first time since at least 1965 that the Cats have opened the season with two 300-yard rushing games. And with 521 yards against Bowling Green, K-State has also eclipsed the 500-yard total offense mark for the first two games of a season for the first time in program history. Five different running backs have recorded touchdowns this year, including three by James Gilbert. And the backs have accounted for nine scores this season after the position group only had 13 a year ago. Mississippi State is also 2-0 after beating Louisiana and Southern Miss to open the season. But this is a team that lost many key pieces to the NFL draft and has a group of players who are serving in-season suspensions, although it's unknown who is being held out or when they will be held out. It's just another great unknown about this game. And let's get started with your preview of the Cats and Dogs. Let's get the roundtable started with Riley Gates to my right. D. Scott Fritchin to my left, and Ryan Wallace in my head because I can't see him, but I can hear him. It's your Go Power Cat roundtable session. And it is brought to you by Robbins Motor Company. K-State fans, visit the Robbins Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram Fiat location on Anderson Avenue in Manhattan for an exciting test drive. Robbins Motor Company, title sponsor of the Power Cat pregame podcast. Well, guys, exactly where they needed to be. Not just 2-0, and but confident, feeling good, believing in their coaches and systems, and about to get kicked in the teeth. We'll see if, how they respond to it. Wally, what do you take out of those first two games? I think just the fact that they were very efficient. You know, that they, they did the job that they were supposed to do, not just in the scoreboard, you know, the win-loss column, but obviously what they've done offensively and defensively. You know, they're not making um, critical errors that are going to cost them, you know, in, in future games against opponents like Mississippi State and those that they'll see in the Big 12. And, you know, really they've just been extremely disciplined, uh, carrying out the offensive schemes and the game plan, the defensive schemes and the game plan. It's just been a really clean football team. And they've taken care of exactly what they needed to to this point, and that's what's gotten them 2-0. Yeah, it really has been impressive. And Riley Gates, offensively, this team takes care of business, but they love to run the ball, and they have had great success running the ball. But we simply do not know what this offense will look like against a Mississippi State defense. While it's not what it was last year, it's still an SEC defense and will be a huge challenge. Well, that's the thing of it is, you know, the the offensive line has blocked so well. The running backs have run so effectively, and they've put up insane numbers on the ground. But at the end of the day, K-State has just been physically better. 
Um, they've been bigger. They've been stronger. They've been more talented than everybody they've seen on the defensive line or, you know, really throughout the entire defense for the last two opponents on the schedule. And it's a double-edged sword, you know. It's On one side, it's K-State's been so good. And even though it's not that good of a good a competition, you still have to think it's impressive. I mean, they could have been doing what they did last year against South Dakota and, and struggling against opponents like this. So it is impressive. But it's not Mississippi State. It's not Oklahoma. It's not Texas. And we just don't know how this offensive line, how these running backs are going to do against competition like that. You know, Mississippi State has lost some players on the defensive line from last year, so it's not as tough of a defensive line as they're facing or as they were facing last year. But man, you know, you just you just have to take it easy and you know, I don't think you can expect three hundred yards on the ground against a, a defense like this, even though it's come so easily in the last two. Well, I expect it. Well, I mean, if they could get I, it, that would be You told cool. me I can't expect it. I expect it. <laughs> <laughs> D. Scott, there's no denying the offensive numbers. It's just been amazing what they've done so far this season. Yeah, obviously, uh, third in the country, 347 rushing yards per game. They're the they're number one in America among teams that aren't from the from the service academies. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and you look at this, Fitz, and they've scored 14 touchdowns in two games. It took K-State six games to get 14 touchdowns last season. <laughs> what? Yes. The time of possession is absurd. The third down conversions have been awesome. You know, my biggest question is when faced with adversity, this is kind of the theme for the week, when faced with adversity, what are you going to do? Yeah, yeah. And that, Ryan Wallace, that goes for Skylar Thompson. He's been really good, but he's been mostly unchallenged. You know, he completed a fourth down pass for a touchdown last week against Bowling Green. But if that pass is dropped or thrown incomplete, so what? They're still going to win. It's easier to make that throw when you know that. This week it's different. Can Skylar respond? I think Skyler will be fine. You know, I just feel like uh, the the confidence that these last two games has given him and given his teammates in him um, will be enough to, I think, keep him pretty poised and relaxed uh, in a hostile environment. I think the 11 a.m. kick will help dampen the mood and the maybe the electric environment that an Alabama or Ole Miss would get typically at Davis Wade. So that already plays into K-State's hands a little bit, but. You know, overall, I think I think what Skyler has gone through to this point before this season um, has already kind of matured him to a point that maybe you wouldn't expect uh, a guy to have with uh, maybe the the stats that he that he has or the the amount of games that he started. He just seems like a, a more elder statesman um, than maybe we give him credit for. And again, I think some of the adversity he faced from within over the last two years at K-State, I think will only help him uh, moving forward, particularly in, in a game like he's going to see on Saturday morning. Riley, we know Kansas State wants to run the ball. That's obvious. I mean, everyone knows that at this point. Hey, if you go back and look at North Dakota State film, they're going to see the same thing in different colored jerseys, hideous jerseys, man, <laughs> than what they're seeing with K-State. It's, it's the same stuff. Much more complex than what K-State's run. They'll do a lot more things than what we've seen. Duh. But they're still going to need to throw the ball. And I'm not sure K-State can get the kind of separation they need to be effective enough in the passing game, at least through the receivers, because a guy like Cameron Dantzler can take away Malik Knowles. He can just take him out of the game. And then you're left with more possession-type guys. Throwing the ball is going to be... Um, just a must. You can't just run, run, run against this team. Well, yeah, I think I think that that's a, a very well-known fact coming in this one. This is an interesting game, and, you know, now that you say that, it really makes us start to go back to one of the concerns we had before the season, which was the wide receiver room. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, obviously losing guys like Isaiah Zuber and losing a potential uh, target in Hunter Ryzen, that was kind of our storyline throughout the summer, was how is this wide receiver room going to handle that? How How are they going to have guys step up and then well they talked about it you know they oh this guy's really doing well this guy's doing really well and then you saw it on the field yeah it, it gets it makes you feel a lot more comfortable but they haven't had to do a lot of that separation yeah. and you know you go back and look at Malik Knowles's two touchdowns from the last game he was covered pretty well on that you know it's not like he was you know one of them he's kind of there but that one the defender was draped all over him and he didn't get that separation. So can a guy like Malik do that in this one? Does Dalton Schoen 
have the ability to kind of make plays and, and get separation where he's probably not going to be faster than a lot of the a lot of Mississippi State's defensive backs out there. That's that's something really interesting to follow and probably something that is going to get overlooked a lot in this one because of how effective K-State's run the ball. That's kind of what a lot of people are talking about, but maybe we should be looking at that pass game a little bit more. Ryan Wallace, K-State has run the ball well. Everyone knows it. Everyone can see it. And Mississippi State certainly knows the running game's coming. If they start bringing those safeties up, I think K-State's going to dial up the tight end and and the fullbacks and things that they just haven't shown in terms of throwing the ball to other people. There's so much in this offense that just hasn't been on display and could be used in this game because I think Chris Kleiman understands the magnitude of winning this contest. I mean, that is true. Um, I I do feel like that there's kind of more up their sleeve than – what they've shown, which is already more than what you would have seen from Bill Snyder to this point out of two games. But, you know, that being said, I I think you could go the other way too. There's probably a lot of things that we haven't seen from this Mississippi state defense that would be able to counter the fullback and tight end position. You know, Leo Lewis is a guy for them that was heavily recruited prospect that, you know, hasn't really been able to do a whole lot to this point. Um, I think he was suspended in the first game for them and um, just was fairly quiet against Southern Miss because he didn't have to do a whole lot in that game. You know, William Gay Jr. is another guy for them that that plays a linebacker role that's super athletic that would be a guy that might be able to take away a fullback, running back, tight end type of uh, uh, pass play. So uh, to that point, you know, Mississippi State is well equipped to do that, but um, getting back to what you were saying, but I, I think that they are going to have to pull out some wrinkles that we haven't seen. And Nick Winters is certainly a guy uh, that I know Wildcat fans are really looking forward to see what he can do because he really hasn't been unleashed yet. And this is K-State's first true test, or I guess maybe Chris Kleiman and Courtney Messingham's first true test of separating themselves from Bill Snyder, you know, in terms of the fact that you are going to have to pull out some things here. You are going to have to kind of get some some out there on tape. And, you know, if they don't throw to the tight end a lot and they struggle, you kind of got to start to question them. Okay, you talked about making the tight end a right. part of your offense, but why didn't you? So that's another thing I think is going to be really fun to follow here is how much do they throw out? You know, how much – how high are they treating this game? You know, are they wanting to put a lot on film for the big 12 or do they care? They've said that they don't care in the past, but they're going to be kind of put to the test in this one. And I'm really interested to see how they handle it because clearly they've been keeping some things off of film so far. And I think that they're going to have to put a lot out there um, on this one on Saturday. D Scott Fritchin, we talk about the unknowns of offense, but Holy cow, the unknowns of defense are far exceed what we've got for offense, if that made sense, that we just don't know about this K-State defense. What we do know is statistically they have looked good if you want to look at points, you want to look at yardage, you want to look at third down conversions. But there's some indicators of trouble, mostly being sacks or lack thereof. One sack, Daniel Green, the last game, I don't care. I mean, if Tommy Stevens is the quarterback or whomever is the quarterback for Mississippi State, you got to be on him, in his face, and knocking him around. You can't let him get comfortable. And they just they haven't shown a lot of pressure so far. Yeah, Buddy Wyatt told me that he believed that it was because they just have not been on the field enough. Okay? They've had 42 passing attempts against the defense. The defense has also been on the field a total of 85 plays so far this season. So I can kind of see some of that. Yeah. Uh, I think the biggest concern is that, um, you know, last year, K-State only had 18 sacks, which was the fewest that it had in the last 25 years. I really thought that with Reggie Walker and Wyatt Huber, especially on the edges, that they might be in a little bit different position right now than they are. But I'm looking to those guys to kind of ramp it up now. I really thought that they would be ahead of this point, you know, and I'm trying to toe that line between disappointed and also giving them the benefit of the doubt because we've talked about how the opposing quarterbacks have gotten rid of the ball quick. We've talked about how the the time of possession just hasn't been in favor of opposing offenses. So you kind of got to play both sides of it there. You got to give credit to the K-State defense for getting off the field and limiting those pass plays. But, man, you really would like to see him get more sacks. Kyle Ball absolutely should have had a sack on Saturday. Mm-hmm. So 
I think it's something to be fairly critical of. You know, it's it's definitely the the defense definitely played well, but they need to get those sack numbers up. And and what a better way to start than this game right here and, and rattling maybe a backup quarterback or a third string quarterback down the line. Yeah, we don't know who they're going to play. We we think Stevens is healthy and will go. Ryan Wallace, Wyatt Hubert did ding his head. We assume it's a concussion. We assume it's not severe because he did get up off the field. But without him, things change drastically. Then you're talking Kyle Ball will play a lot. Boom Massey will play a lot. They have a very good two deep, but when it becomes three players in the heat of Mississippi, that can really affect you. Wyatt Hubert's as important to this defense as anyone, isn't he? I think he is. You know, I think just his presence on defense is big. You know, I think that this is a defense that really feeds off his energy. Um, and he's certainly kind of uh, come out of his shell a little bit over the course of the last year. But I'm interested to see this might be the type of game. And, and don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that Wyatt Hubert, you know, is, is a guy that, that K-State can live without. But maybe in this game could be the type of environment or the type of, of matchup that favors a guy like Boom Massey. You know, I was watching the broadcast of Southern Miss and uh, from ESPN last weekend, and they brought up a graphic that, Mississippi State's offense, as far as the players on the field per snap, is the number three biggest team weight-wise uh, in the FBS. They're big. They love to throw their bodies around. They're a lot like K-State on that offensive line um, where they return some experience and some veteran guys. You know, Wyatt Hubert, is, is you're kind of going big on big. You know, Wyatt's key is, is strength, is out-muscling guys. With Boo Massey, he's got some speed, and – was arguably probably the, the fastest of the defensive ends that K-State can throw at you. So I think maybe getting him on the field a little bit more or a guy like Kyle Ball that is a little bit shorter but can kind of have that bend to go around and go up and under some guys um, might actually work in K-State's favor. But um, I, I, it'll just be interesting to see, you know, if, Wyatt, if they, they struggle getting that pressure without Wyatt Hubert, um, it's time for Scotty Hazleton and those guys to dial up some – some more pressure plays like we saw bringing heat from Daniel Green, Elijah Sullivan, and maybe even a nickel like Jerome McPherson. Well, we know Mississippi State wants to throw the ball. They've been really effective with it. I mean, Stevens is completing 72.5% of his passes. Not bad. Not bad at all. Decent. Uh, and, again, we don't know a whole lot about the back end of this defense. Walter Neal seems to be good at corner, seems to be more at home at corner. A.J. Parker's had his moments. You know, I'm still waiting for Wayne Jones to erupt, and maybe it's this game in which he does it. But, Riley, they're going to be tested. This this is going to be a test. And I don't care if Mississippi State's rebuilding their receiver core. And they brought in Isaiah Zuber as a senior transfer. The fact that they've only needed Isaiah Zuber for one catch in a rebuilding situation tells me that these guys are pretty good, even though they aren't up to the standards what they're used to. Well, and I think we can all agree that this quarterback situation they have, no matter who's out there on the field, is a lot better suited in this offense than what Nick Fitzgerald was a year ago. I mean, he did his damage to K-State pretty much on the ground. Um, and, and I think that that's what's going to be a little bit different this year um, between between these two teams is that the pass is going to become a very big um, and, and very crucial factor for, for Mississippi State in this one. And it's one of those things where – we just don't have an answer. We don't know what to tell people to expect because they have not been battle tested. Wayne Jones has not seen any quarterback to the caliber that he's probably going to see on Saturday. And, you know, a guy like Walter Neal, he's been doing fine, but how's he going to face up against top receivers? You know, let's say he goes against Isaiah Zuber. Is he going to be able to keep up with the, with the speed of Isaiah? So I, you know, I, I definitely have concerns out there. I've, I've seen good things. You know, A.J. Parker made that play in the first game of the season. He almost had a second one, too, against Bowling Green, second interception. So I've seen flashes. I've seen a little bit of it. But I just don't have an answer of what to expect. I don't know if what I'm going to, you know, I don't know if I, what I would be able to predict would be accurate. And unfortunately, it's just kind of a wait and see type yeah. thing and see how they handle it. If I may add one more thing, just to kind of piggyback on what Riley was saying about the question marks of this kind of back half in the secondary, you know, one of the, my biggest concerns entering this game, and one thing I'm really looking forward to seeing this K-State defense do is maybe correct some of the missed tackle issues we've seen. I mean, it's hard to really 
hammer a defense that has been so good to this point. But if you look at the success that Nichols had limited and the limited success that Bowling Green had, a lot of it came on drives where there were some key missed tackles. And you look at a guy like Kylan Hill, uh, he's the number three running back in, in all of college football as far as uh, forced missed tackles, the guys that he makes miss. Um, and then you look at those receivers on the outside, they're enormous. And they get a guy like Isaiah Zuber, who is one of K-State's, quote, bigger receivers over the last couple of years in the slot. Uh, and they can allow him to be more of a shifty guy that they can put in, sp- in space. You're demanding a lot out of two guys like Denzel Goolsby and Wayne Jones, among others, to really come up and wrap up. It's an intriguing matchup. I like this matchup a whole lot better than I did last year, even though yeah. the game was in Manhattan. I hated that matchup because I knew that defense was so good. And as good as K-State's offensive line was, they got clowned. They really yeah. did. It was just a mismatch from the get-go. Uh, and then Mississippi State's offensive line did a marvelous job opening up enough space for Kylan Hill to operate, and then Nick Fitzgerald just ran all over him. It was it was not pretty to watch. But, Fritz, something's got to give here. Mississippi State has won one non-conference game since the beginning of time against a Power 5 school. That was last year. And K-State has kind of stunk on the road, haven't they? Yeah, sure has. Um, Mississippi State is 0-3 at home against Power 5 non-conference opponents since 2000, which is amazing. <laughs> they lost to Oregon. They lost to West Virginia. They lost to Georgia Tech in 2009. K-State, on the other hand, kind of smelling blood a little bit, I kind of think. 28-24 over Miami in 2011, which really catapulted that season. But, you know, they had the loss at Stanford and the loss at Vanderbilt. But it kind of harkens me back to those days of that Miami game in 2011 yeah. where – Things just kind of hit stride for K-State. But, this, you know, it's always interesting to, to go into these games, especially from a sports writer perspective, and be able to write K-State for the first time since da-da-da. Well, this would be K-State for the first time since 1982, beating an SEC school during the regular season. The last time K-State beat a SEC school on the road, 1910. Yeesh. I remember that well. <laughs> I was I was covering the team back then. Yeah, this is big. Ryan Wallace, it, it's a win if you get it, a loss if you lose. Simple math. But if you win this, it gives you a lot more than one in the right column. It gives you something you just can't buy. All of a sudden, K-State's turnaround with Chris Kleiman becomes very tangible for K-State people and very scary for everyone else. Well, yeah, I, and I think even the most rational and realistic of fans still thought that 6-6 six and six coming into this year was certainly, definitely possible. And that was pretty much factoring in a 100% loss in Starkville. Yeah. And now we're talking about the possibility of, of a win on Saturday. That changes. You've got a, a whole lot of season left um, to – you know, really build upon that and be much better than six and six. And I, I can't emphasize enough what a fantastic uh, comparison D Scott just gave, because it is eerily similar to this, the road trip that Bill Snyder's team took to Miami as the kind of feeling that I'm getting around the team. I spoke to uh, someone close to the team earlier this week that mentioned just how confident this group is a quiet confidence. Uh, heading in, which was very, very similar to what we saw when they had, had down, uh, went down to South Beach and beat Ja'Cory Harris and those guys with, with that Trey Walker goal line stand at the end. Uh, it, it is, again, the only way I can describe it is eerily similar, uh, the type of confidence that I'm getting out of this group heading into a game that, like you said, Fitz, is becoming more and more winnable. If they were to win this game, I mean, I think your expectations go from six and six or seven and five at best to can they win go eight and four? Could they sneak out a nine and three? It makes a lot more games winnable. Those toss ups, you know, on the road at Oklahoma State. Well, we just did it at Mississippi State. Why can't we go do it there? The home toss ups with Baylor, TCU, Iowa State. I mean, those are those are fifty yeah. fifty games in my opinion as of right now that if you win this Mississippi State game, you look at a lot more confidently. Two weeks ago, I would have laughed at you if you said <laughs> K-State would be uh, considered a potential winner at Mississippi State. As you said, Ryan Wallace, two weeks later, two games in, I'm like, yeah, they can do this. 
I don't know if I'm ready to go there yet, ready to make that prediction. Maybe I will. Why not? You know, when in Rome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, it, either way, it's not going to surprise me. What will surprise me if this game's a blowout? Either way. It will surprise me if K-State gets humiliated, and it will disappoint me if they get injuries along the way. That's the only downside I see to this game. Go down there, play better than last year, and you're going to leave there still feeling okay about this new system, you know, that it's taking you forward from where you were. Go down there and win. Like I said, it, it doesn't just change the context of future games. It changes the players. It changes what's between their ears, and it's going to be very interesting. Wally, any final thoughts before we sign off this roundtable? I'm, I'm as excited about this game as I have been in a long, long time. I'm not going to lie. I'm a little envious of, of the counterparts there with you, D. Scott Fritz and Riley Gates, for getting to go down there. And, you know, not only – yeah, they got to experience some cowbells, but I think Starkville is kind of a quietly underrated city. It kind of reminds me of Manhattan from what I've heard. And uh, it, it, I'm really envious of some of the good eats that you might be able to have down there, guys even more so if you're celebrating a victory. I've heard some good things already, and I found out this week that they have yingling in many places in both Jackson, Mississippi, and in Starkville, Mississippi. So things are going good right now for the Go Power Cat team. Yes, indeed. Well, they will head out on Friday, heading down in that direction, staying in Jackson because Starkville is apparently like old Manhattan where there's no hotel rooms. <laughs> it's going to be one fun road trip for the media, because it's a fun venue to go into the SEC, but mostly the fans. I think a lot of fans are going to head down there. Well, that's it for this roundtable session as we prepare you for Kansas State and Mississippi State on the Powercat pregame podcast sponsored by Robbins Motor Company. On the other side of the break, we've got our analysts all lined up to talk about this game. We'll be right back. The experts from GoPowerCat.com will return with more on the PowerCat pregame podcast presented by Robbins Motor Company. With Blue Link Plus, you can access your Hyundai Tucson Limited remotely. Doors unlocked, temperature set, lost car found. There it is. Get complimentary class leading Blue Link Plus. Call 562-314-4603 for complete details. We now send it back to the PowerCat podcast. Joining you once again, it's Tim Fitzgerald and Go PowerCat football analyst Marcus Watts. Welcome back to the PowerCat pregame podcast as we shift gears into our analyst section of the podcast of your pregame prep session. Marcus Watts, Brian Hanley, and Kelly Stewart in this section. And we'll start here with Marcus in one second. The dedicated team of automotive professionals at Robbins Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram Fiat will match you with a vehicle that suits your lifestyle and budget. Robbins Motor Company, title sponsor of the Pyrocat pregame podcast. Okay, Marcus Watts, Kansas State is 2-0. and Kansas State is unblemished. They are untouched. They are unscathed, other than Wyatt Hubert. We're still wondering what his situation is. This is an intriguing thing. We, If you put out a best-case scenario for K-State through the first two games, this is probably it. Line up, take care of business, look good, offense looks good, limited mistakes, hardly any penalties. Chris Kleiman's got it going in the right direction through two games. Yeah, it's something that you haven't seen from K-State for many years. Too long. Come out first two games and just completely dominate the games. Um, you know, and it, it was refreshing to see. It's, you saw a rejuvenated team, a team that was playing more loose, uh, not playing scared to make mistakes. Uh, and they, I think they simplified things for these players these first two games just to get their confidence up. Uh, they're going to throw a lot more at him this week. I mean, they're going to need to. Skyler Thompson's probably going to have to do more in this game than he's had to do in the first two games, because uh, I just, you know, I just don't see them running for 330 yards every single game. Yeah. So you know, you're going to have to open up the passing attack uh, to loosen up the defense a little bit because teams are going to stack the box against K State and try to stop that run. I will make a bold and daring prediction right now in your segment. If they run for 300 or more a game and hold the ball for 40 plus minutes a game, they'll win a lot of games. They'll win a lot of games. They won't win every game because <laughs> there's some teams out there that can score in about two minutes. I know. You do get into that. Sometimes time of possession doesn't mean a darn thing in modern football because they score so quickly. This Mississippi State team is also 2-0, and but they have not looked impressive. This is a shadow of the team. Eh, maybe not a shadow. This is a lesser team than what we saw last year in Manhattan when they dominated K-State 31-10. to 
that game was far worse than 21 points. That was a manhandling. They couldn't handle the Mississippi State running game, in part because Kylan Hill was so good, the running back, but Nick Fitzgerald was just a beast, and he kind of ran through Colin Klein style through that K-State defense. He's gone. They've gone to a more traditional passing game mixed in with the running game. I mean, it's it's very similar to K-State's system. Tommy Stevens, their quarterback, is very efficient. He injured a shoulder last week, expected to play. This is going to be a different offensive team. They're going to show K-State a lot of the things K-State likes to do. So I'm intrigued to see how the two teams handle each other. Yeah, and it'll be good for K-State's defense. It'll be good for Mississippi State's defense because they're kind of going to see, you know, they've been practicing against these offenses that like to run the ball um, and then, you know, the passing game off of the run. And so I think it's an advantage for K-State just because they struggled so much last year with the run game um, that, you know, they have seen more of it pounding at them uh, in practices with K-State's new offense and how Coach yeah. or how Coach Kleiman's wanting to pound the ball and stuff. So, you know, it, it's going to take – this is a dude's game right. this weekend, and there's going to be a lot of smash-mouth football. But I could also see K-State saying, <laughs> let's spread it out and throw it around, you know, with, with Skyler because he's just shown so much confidence. Um, that you know, K State may have to do that in this game to win this game yeah. because the front four and the front seven for Mississippi State is still really good. Even though they had two first round draft picks right. off that defensive line last year, they still have some guys that are you know first round picks this year. So it, it's going to challenge their offensive line. Yeah, they're young at defensive tackle, but they're still getting dudes, man. They're still getting guys that can play ball. There's no doubt about it. I'm going to be fascinated to see if K-State uses a lot of play action because Mississippi State is convinced K-State's going to run the ball and run the ball and run the ball. And maybe they will do that earlier, but as you bring those safeties up, K-State will throw to the tight end. That's something opponents haven't had to worry about in the past, but the tight end, Nick Lenners, Sammy Wheeler, the more athletic ones, could get right by you in a, in a heartbeat. And the one thing you can't do as a, as a coach, and Coach Kleiman, Coach Messingham, is, is get away from the run if they're stacking right. the box and they're stopping your run. you still got to give it to them um, to set up that play-action pass. Just don't go away from it if it's not working. Try to find something else, some other type of run that may work. Uh, with what the defense is giving you. But, yeah, Skyler's going to have to have a game this game. He's going to have to play like he has the first two games. He's going to have to hit his receivers. Receivers are going to have to catch the ball. Yeah. I was really excited to see Malik uh, put the first game behind him and come back and make some unbelievable catches. That just shows the type of player he is. He's a, he's a redshirt freshman. He's going to make mistakes. He's gonna he's still going to struggle throughout the year. He's going to have those games where he drops some passes that he should catch. But if he can bounce back and make some of those catches, it's going to help this offense spread out more. This running back by committee, I've never been a fan of it, and it's working quite well. It helps in a game like this, one that's going to be physical, one that's going to be extremely hot and humid, as expected to be in midday when they get into the second half. Having a bunch of guys playing could really be to K-State's advantage in this game. Yeah, to keep keep your guys fresh in the back. Mm -hmm. um, I could see maybe less carries for maybe some guys. You know, I think they'll ride the hot hand. Um, but I still think that, you know, all three guys, you know, Trotter, Brown, and Gilbert, uh, are, they're, they're still going to get a lot of carries. Uh, and it's going to be spread out. There isn't going to be one guy that gets, you know, 30 carries a game or 25 carries a game. But you can throw a fresh guy at the defense late in the game in the fourth quarter. Casey's running backs are going to be fresh. The defense is going to be tired. And so you're going to be able to throw those fresh guys out. Um, but it's all one at the trenches. It's going to be offensive line versus defensive line on both sides of the ball for K-State and Mississippi State. And who wants it more? And, you know, I think at this time, K-State, you know, if they can get up and start pounding it down their throat, you may see Mississippi State quit. You know, those are types of players, you know, that have, have been stars on their high school teams. Yeah. You know, once things start going the wrong way, they may quit. Like I said, this Mississippi State team isn't nearly as good as last year's. They haven't looked really efficient. They put up good offensive numbers. I mean, Kylan Hill's just running defenses ragged right now. 41 carries, 320, two TDs, 7.8 yards per carry. He's a big concern. And a big concern for me is I don't know what to expect from this K-State defense. They have not been challenged, nor have they shown much. They have one sack mostly because they just didn't do anything fancy on defense. How will they respond when the other team starts picking up first downs, converting third downs, and running the ball on them? 
Yeah, the defense is going to be on the field a lot more in this game than they have the first two games, that's yeah. for sure. Uh, but, hey, yeah, you never know. They might get three and outs uh, like you want defenses to get, and they may not play that much. And But, uh, you know, I, th- I think that Scotty Hazleton will have this defense ready. I think those first two games, you know, he kept it simple. Let the guys play fast. Now he's going to throw a little more wrinkles because it, with a team, you know, the stepping up of competition, you're not going to be able to just keep it simple, generic base defenses. You're going to have to throw some wrinkles in there uh, that are more specific against what Mississippi State's trying to do offensively. Uh, and I think Scotty, Scotty Hazleton has proven to, you know, get these guys fired up. I think a lot of it's going to depend on Wyatt Hubert and his health. He is a huge loss if he's not right. playing in this game. Um, because he takes one guy for sure, maybe even two guys th- that they're going to have to key on because he is that dominant of a force as a defensive lineman. I agree. It, I would hope he's going to play, but if it is a concussion like we think it is, who knows what his recovery time is. Everyone's different. We'll see how it all plays out. He would make a big difference for K-State. If they win, how significant is it for K-State football? It's huge. I mean, it's a stepping stone. I mean, last year at this time, this is kind of when everything went downhill for K-State right. after that Mississippi State game. If K-State can play well in this game, not necessarily win this game. I mean, they don't have to win this game. Right. But if they play well, it still sets them up for Big 12 play. It's tough to go down anywhere and win, let alone an SEC, you know, a team that's been a good team for years and years and years. And, and that probably – you know, star-wise, has better athletes and better player football players than you do. Um, so if they win this game, it could jump board because there's some teams in the Big 12 this year that I thought were going to be a lot better than they actually yeah. are. And so I can see seven, eight wins uh, if they win this game. And if, and if they win it handily, now obviously I don't think that uh, this K-State team can play with the Oklahomas and Texases quite yet. They just don't have enough bodies. They just, they just don't have the depth. They don't have the bodies. But they can finish anywhere between four and six in this conference right. very easily. Well, I'm very intrigued to see what Saturday brings for this K-State football program. A lot of people out there are suddenly Chris Kleiman believers. He promised them football is football, and they went out and played some pretty darn good football for two weeks, and now it gets a lot tougher. I, I'll I, tell you one thing. Yeah. K-State, if they're going to win this game in Mississippi State, they got to have someone with special teams. And then special it's not teams has impressive. No, and you know, um, even field goals. You know, the field goal that he made last week, he barely made it, and it wasn't a deep field goal. No, he's, it's he's, twenty-seven yards. And the kickoff team, it, they got to figure that out this week because it, it was horrendous. Yeah, last yeah, week. I and agree. If special teams is is plays the way that they have been playing. It hurts K State's chances to win this game. I would agree with that. You can't make mistakes. Certainly in special teams. Can't have turnovers and penalties. Duh. But I think the winner of this game will be the defense that makes the fewest mistakes. The other offenses are trying to get you out of alignment and take advantage of some of those breaches in the defense. So if K-State can get lined up right and do the right things after snap, they're going to be okay because they're going to want to move Mississippi State around quite a bit and maybe get those safeties sucked up to the line and get over the top of them. It'll be fun. Thanks, Marcus. And now we bring in our second Go Power Cat football analyst, Brian Hanley, who handles post-game duties with me and makes an appearance on the pregame show. It's kind of like you're the bookend. <laughs> I'm trying to be. <laughs> uh, hopefully we have fun things to talk about Saturday after the game. But even if it's not a victory, this will be in a very enlightening afternoon in Starkville for Kansas State football fans, won't it? Yes, it will. It's going to be a a good test, a really good test, a step, huge step up in competition. Uh, But I think the guys are excited. I know I'm excited. You know, you got those first two games, and they were impressive, and they did what you really wanted them to do, and maybe that caught people off guard that it was so dominating, even though it was lesser competition. So check and check. And now it gets a lot tougher, just so much tougher. And not only because it's a better team, it's an SEC team, even if it's one kind of in a rebuilding phase this year, and it's on the road. So a lot of things are going to get thrown at these guys. Things have been easy compared to what they will see Saturday kicking off at 11 a.m. in Starkville. It's just going to get so much more difficult, won't it? 
Oh, yeah. Well, the thing about football teams is adversity builds football teams. And there's going to be adversity for the first time. And if if nothing else, just kind of what you said, just because we're on the road, you know, in a hostile territory uh, with all those daggone cowbells going off, you know, all over the place. Uh, But it's it's the team is there. I'm not saying they're the best team in the SEC and they're not as talented as what they were last year, but they are still really big, really fast, really athletic. So it's it's going to be a really good test to see where we are this is one of the bigger offensive lines in the entire country so that will yes. that will stress k-state's defense but i want to talk about k-state's offense right now they have run the ball very well and it's easy to say it was just lesser competition than k-state lined up and you know eventually manhandled them with with size and strength but a lot of it's been schematic too a lot of it's right. been just out scheming your opponent and not letting them line up right and that can still work against a much more talented and skilled defense like the bulldogs it absolutely can work you get a hat on a hat your formation motions you know counters just little just little things i mean little tidbits that maybe we haven't even seen yet which i'm sure we have a ton of stuff that we haven't seen yet that we're going to throw out there that can just catch them off guard. And, you know, if we get seven yards, you know, four yards, you know, as long as we're moving forward, that's the key. I don't want people to get too discouraged and thinking that we have to run for 400 yards to win a football game, you know, against good competition. That's not the case. As long as we're moving forward and doing those things and having the positive plays on, on offense, especially offensive line play, we're going to be okay. Cause that's really the key is just getting a hat on a hat and moving the football effectively and not having too many negative plays because that's what drive killers I mean because that's what will kill you the negative plays Chris Kleiman and I share an opinion that in the first and second quarter two and three yard gains with a running the ball serve a purpose Yes, they do. They, and, yes, and a lot of do. people in this new age of football that want to score every time you touch the darn thing don't realize that just plowing forward and being physical and setting a tone and wearing down the defense and most importantly establishing that you are going to run the ball so linebackers and safeties, you better pay attention to it. That's really important, and I think that's something K-State has set Mississippi State up with in these first two games. Hey, look at the running game. Hey, look at that. Look how much they're going to run the ball. And, they, Brian, they haven't thrown it to the tight end very often. They haven't thrown it nope. to the running backs and fullbacks. Nope. That's all in the back pocket, and I think it's going to come out on Saturday. Yep, we've been very, very vanilla. I know that a lot of people think that when you move guys around and, and you use a lot of players that we're doing a lot of stuff, that really hasn't been the case. We haven't done a whole lot that's been different. I mean, if you just watch, you know, we haven't done a whole lot. There's been there's not that many different plays, and we definitely kind of what you said. I mean, we've thrown to receivers, and that's what we've done. And there's a, just so much more to the offense that we're going to break out in this game uh, because we're going down there to win a football game. And you lay everything out on the line. This is not a game where you don't want anybody. No, 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 no. We're going down there to win a football game. So we're throwing it all out there. We're emptying our bag. And it is what it is. And let the chips fall where they may. And if everything gets spilled out and they end up winning in Starkville, then we'll deal with that later. If everyone right. everything's on film, so be it. This is one of those offenses. This isn't a case. Um, I'm not saying this isn't what they believe, but this isn't a case of we're just going to run our stuff and you still have to stop it. This is a case of we're going to run our stuff and you still may not be able to figure it out. You you may not. That's right. You might get lined up wrong. You might not follow the right guy, or you certainly might take your eyes off that running back or tight end that just went past you. We've That's seen a, exactly right. Seen a little bit of it, but I'm I'm anxious to see if they really bring out more of it. And apparently, they've got you know designs for all three of these main running backs to be on the field at the same time. That gives the defense a lot to worry about. 
it's a ton to worry about and it's a ton to prepare for and you just don't have that kind of time so it's going to be very interesting I'm, I'm interested to see all the the nuances and what we threw out the stuff that we haven't seen uh, i'm sure things that they they practice every single day um things that we haven't seen as kansas state fans in a long time so, you know because you know the offense and some of the stuff that we do is a lot different than what coach snyder did so it's going to be interesting to see and it's going to be a physical football game i mean I, but we're going to have to throw it don't get me wrong. We're yeah. going to have to throw the football to win. We're not going to just be able to line up and run for 400 yards and win this football game. That's not going to happen. We're going to have to throw it. Get the receivers, I think, are going to be even more key in this game because Mississippi State knows that we like to run the football. They're going to bring that extra safety down in the box. And on occasions, not I shouldn't say on occasions, a lot of the times they're going to make us throw it right. when we don't necessarily want to throw it. We're we're going to have to check and make us throw the football and the wide receivers are going to be one-on-one -on -one, and they're going to have to get open. And that is what I'm excited to see because I believe that we can. I just believe that it's not me being a homer. It's just me being that realistic and looking and seeing what's going on. I think we've got the guys and we've got the quarterback to be able to do those things and be successful. On the other side of the ball, we still don't know a whole lot about the K-State defense simply because they've been too darn good at times in those first two games, getting teams off the field on third and fourth down, getting the big play when you need the big play, and certainly not making mistakes very often. They did it against Nichols, lesser against Bowling Green. They were pretty sharp from top to right. bottom, even when they brought in the subs. They're going to have problems in this game. Now, this is a – Kylan yes. Hill can run the ball. Their quarterback's completing at a high clip. This is a very advanced offense. And in some ways, what uh, Joe Moorhead likes to run at Mississippi State didn't look like what he's running this year because Nick Fitzgerald couldn't throw the ball like That's he right. wanted to. And this offense kind of looks like K-State. They're going to spread it around and, and try to make things happen. This defense is going to have their hands full with this Bulldogs offense. They are. They are because they're a lot bigger than we are. So they're going to be more physical. So it's going to be a lot of more, you know, schematics on our part, right. slanting guys, twisting guys, blitzing. I mean, that's one thing that we really haven't done a ton of, of blitzing, maybe zone blitzing here, bringing a safety or a corner. It's just going to be, we're going to have to mix it up because they're bigger than we are. Right. And they're going to be more physical. You know that when they want to run the football, they're going to run the football. But that's kind of what it goes back to overcoming adversity. They're going to get some plays. They're going to get some chunk plays. It's just about overcoming that and getting to the next play. Okay, they got us on this one. But you know what? Let's win this play. And then let's win the next play. And I think if we have that mentality of not surrendering because they get big plays on us, that's going to be a huge key to the football game. As a former football player, how much is just that immeasurable belief that you have you're going to win a game? I mean, this team seems to have that. They seem to have no doubts in their coaches and system. And I would think going into a game like this, that can carry you a long ways. It can carry you a really long ways, Tim. Uh, the confidence level, like I mentioned last week, comes from going out and dominating two opponents. Regardless of their uh, you know, the other opponent's ability, we went out and did what we wanted to, and we stomped them. We stopped what they wanted to do, and we did whatever we wanted to do. So that's confidence. you got to remember, these are kids. you know. And as kids, the confidence just breeds itself. When you have it, when you have success, it just continues. And it seems that they just have that belief that, you know what? It doesn't really matter who we play at this point. We're going to go out there and do what we do and go win. Now, again, there's going to be some adversity. It's kind of what I was talking about. But it seems that the guys have a belief and they just believe in the system, like you said, and that they're just going to go out there. They, they're confident. And I believe that the kids are smart. I mean, kids are a lot smarter these days than they were when I played. I'm telling you. They, they're just they're smart. And they understand, hey, we're doing this, but we have so much more in our back that we haven't shown that it's going to be out there for everyone to see that they're not going to know what hit them. I just, I, I sense that I kind of have the, the same sense that you do Tim, when it comes to that.
His name is Brian Hanley. He was an offensive lineman on those great 97 and 98 Kansas State football teams, and now he's an analyst for GoParacad.com. So when he says K-State's a good football team, he knows darn well what a good football team looks like. Thank you, Brian. I will talk to you after the game. Okay. Look forward to it. And now we go off to Las Vegas in hearts and minds and visit Kelly Stewart from wagertalk.com. Fun announcement this week, Kelly. Uh, Go Paracats doing stuff with Wager Talk now. Yeah, I'm really excited. You know, I had mentioned uh, as kind of a joke that there's not a lot of primetime games this week. There's not a lot of marquee matchups, nothing really exciting. And I go, come on, you guys, K-State, Mississippi State. That's a marquee game in my eyes. Uh, and my boss got to laugh and he said, well, how come you haven't introduced us to these guys yet? You know, we're doing some stuff with some other college football teams and uh, we got the deal done quick. Yeah, that's fun. It won't be every week, but certainly this week, it's an interesting game, probably even in Las Vegas, because like you said, it is a crappy lineup of games this weekend uh, around the country. But K-State, Mississippi, State has a level of intrigue to it and certainly has a much higher level of intrigue to this game than the first two K-State games. Give me your early thoughts on the Cats and Bulldogs. Yeah, the Cats, man, they have looked really good. So I'm trying to reel in my perception, (laughs) right? We had talked about several times how K-State has shown us moments of greatness over the the first week. But again, Nichols, we got to kind of, again, right heed our expectations just a little bit. And then last week, absolutely shut out Bowling Green. I said, you know, hey, I'm not ready to lay 24 with the Cats. I had a lot of people ask me, Kelly, why aren't you playing K-State this week? That looks kind of like a sharp play. I said, you know, because Bill Snyder has kind of made me realize that as a 23 and a half point favorites, K-State has not fared well over the years. And uh, hey, looks like a new regime change with uh, Chris Kleiman and Maybe he's going to start setting a new precedence. You know, Coach hasn't lost a game in, what, two or three years? It's crazy. It's uh, it's almost like you have muscle memory for gambling. Like you yeah. couldn't get, you couldn't break the Snyder habits, and I understand that because most fans out there are going through it. This has been fun. This has been different, and certainly uh, brings back some memories of what they used to do in these non-conference games, but haven't been doing it. Mississippi State, on the flip side, they've looked okay. You know, they're, it's almost like their offensive output doesn't match the scores of the games. They, offensively, they've looked pretty good, but they've only put up 38 points in both games. And they've, you know, won comfortably, but not in blowout fashion against their first two opponents, Louisiana and Southern Miss. I actually don't know what to think about Mississippi State more than I can figure out K-State, if that made sense. I'm really baffled. Oh, for sure. That makes complete and utter sense. I laid the big chalk with Mississippi State week one. A lot of sharp guys did. The numbers said, hey, this is the play. And God, did they look ugly for almost 90% of that game. They did start to pull away there at the end, but... Man, this is a Mississippi State team I think is is really missing Nick Fitzgerald from last season. I think that we're going to see something different on our end. You can throw in a little bit of a revenge factor for K-State. Obviously, last year's 31-10 loss in Manhattan was ugly. They held us to a season low, 213 yards. Um, but K-State, 23-8 and as a visiting underdog against the spread. Those are Bill Snyder numbers. And I've told everybody, Bill Snyder is an underdog. Absolutely amazing. I took the nine. It came out Sunday. I was sitting at the sports book. Uh, one of the perks of my new job over at Bleacher Report is we get to hang out with celebrities and <laughs> athletes. And so I'm watching the Bengals game with Chad Ochocinco. And I said, wow, nine. I'm getting nine points. And I text my buddy Kenny, who does a lot with power ratings, because I didn't have anything in front of me. No computer, no nothing besides my phone. And he goes, ah, kid, I don't know. And I go, you know what? This nine is going to be gone. Sure enough, it's now seven and a half yeah. across the board. So I did get the best of the number, and I think I'm going to stick with it. Listen, I, again, I think K-State has shown me enough to where I, I believe that Chris Kleiman wants to get a win. Here now, will he actually get it done is another story. Nine points, I think, is entirely too many. I, I do believe K-State's defense has really shown me – improvement from last season granted it is hard because we quote unquote haven't played anybody uh but i do think that it is going to be 
one of those scenarios that's within a touchdown. K-State may be able to pull off the upset. I may end up sprinkling a little bit on the money line, but I, I have a feeling this reminds me of the Auburn game a few years ago where K-State is going to beat themselves, not necessarily get beat by Mississippi State. Yeah, yeah. So even at seven and a half, you would probably take K-State if you had to? Yeah, I, I would. I, again, I, like I said, I, I bet it early. We have the benefit of that happening here in Las Vegas. The numbers come out a lot earlier than they do around everywhere else, or you have to bet offshore, obviously. That being said, um, I really do think at seven and a half, that hook makes it look really nice. Listen, again, the Bulldogs haven't played anybody either. 38 points versus Louisiana Lafayette. It, meh. I do think K-State has run the ball really well. Yeah. I know it's going to be tough against this Mississippi State defense. But, again, I'm impressed with what I've seen from Coach thus far and uh, maybe keep that scrappy Bill Snyder underdog streak alive. Well, Mississippi State has not beaten a non-conference Power 5 opponent at home in uh, 20 years simply because they yeah. don't do it. So you, there's not much history out there. I mean, this SEC scheduling is just ridiculous, how light they schedule quite often in the non-conference. In fact, that was uh, they are like one in six over the last, I don't know how many years, against Power 5 non-conference opponents, and we know who the one win was against. It was last year in Manhattan. This is a very, very difficult game to read, but I agree with you. I think Mississippi State's getting a lot of respect on uh, – previous years what they had last year the name the sec and i think k-state is beginning to as you can see by how the line is dropping uh that k-state's getting a lot of respect around the country right now yes they are and uh usually when the line's dropping on the underdog it's a good sign for everybody involved um usually that's some pretty significant money coming in because the bookmakers know they're going to get money in mm -hmm. on the sec team laying points no matter what that sec team is we saw it last week with byu against tennessee byu went in there was able to get the outright win we saw it uh last week with miami against unc because their name is miami um and while mississippi state doesn't have quite those big type names you're going to see money come in on Mississippi State, but it's not going to matter. Well, what else out there in college football sticks out to you? Maybe the Big 12. I know the, the college game day crew will be in Ames, Iowa. Biggest thing to hit Ames since well ever, ever. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and which I find intriguing because it looks so bad against Northern Iowa to open the season and yet they get game day anyhow because that's how bad the slate is. Iowa at Iowa that State is, the, slate is. is the marquee game. Ugh. It's interesting. I, we talked about it a little bit on this podcast that I do with one of the bookmakers over the Westgate called Kelly and Murray. And uh, John Murray is a West Virginia alum. So he's new to the Big 12. And we kind of went down the big eight hole. And I said, listen, Ames, Iowa is where hopes and dreams go to die in November yeah. against a three win Iowa State team. That's just the way it's yeah. always going to be. I know Iowa State under Matt Campbell has been better. I don't care. This is a place where it's really hard to bet against Iowa State. It always has been, whether they're laying points, whether they're taking points. And we saw last season the Iowa State Cyclones kind of hit a threshold where they were laying too many points at a point in time. Yeah. The, the market had caught up with them, and I thought, hey, there's going to be some great spots to bet against Iowa State this year. I'm not doing it in this game. I, I do think the number is right, and uh, that's just how I see it. This is not a scenario where – I would be surprised if I won the game outright. I wouldn't be surprised. But I, I think, to me, it's Iowa State or pass. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is such a good rivalry game. We've seen Iowa State pull the upset so many times over Iowa. And this time wouldn't be any different. I, again, I, I have Iowa State winning this game by at least a touchdown. Well, we'll so take, yeah. the, take the two and a half with the Cyclones, especially at home. And as far as the rest of the Big 12 goes, I'm not really wanting to get involved in Oklahoma State, Tulsa. We've seen Tulsa play scrappy over the years, but Oklahoma State, man, that opening night against Oregon State showed me if you don't have defense, might as well just yeah. get ran over because that is exactly what's going to happen to you. Um, Texas is always interesting after coming off a loss. You know, they ended up pushing. If you, if you bet that game late and you took the seven uh, with Tom Herman and those guys, and I think they – they left a lot on the field. Um, and I was kind of looking, Hey, do you, is this a team you want to bet against this week? Is it not? I think, I think this is just a point where you just stay away here and Oklahoma at UCLA 
is rather interesting as well. Um, UCLA, man, I wanted to bet against them so bad last week with San Diego State, and I didn't do it. I let a bunch of smarter people than I am talk me out of it, which is usually never a good thing. Um, and I looked at I looked at back in OU again. I just I, I just can't do it. I think we're going to see a really great game from Oklahoma, but I think it's just a tad too many points. UCLA yeah. obviously not starting off the season well. And uh, and I just don't know what I'm going to get with this team. But to lay 23 and a half is just too many. Yeah, on the road, that's remarkable. That's a lot of points to give up. Although I still might tend to do it, but don't well, follow my the advice. Over, the over has already ticked up four points. Um, and uh, I wanted I wanted to at 69 and a half. I wanted to, to bet the over. Now it's at 73 and a half. So my advice is let it keep getting higher and higher and higher. Um, bet the under before, right before kickoff. I, I bet it gets a few ticks higher and, and don't be surprised to see that under cash really late with the original betters um, hitting that over. Very interesting. Her name is Kelly Stewart. She is a case stater. You can find her at wagertalk.com. You can go back and watch the Showtime series action. It was great. Man, there's some troubled people in your industry. <laughs> Listen, we we had a we had a great time filming it. A uh, few people we didn't know were going to be on the show ended up being on the show. So you, you know how the producers like to keep it sneaky like yep, that. Yep. It was great stuff. And you can hear her every week right here on the Powercat pregame podcast. Thank you, Kelly. Appreciate it very much. Thanks, Tim. Well, that will wrap up our analyst portion of the PowerCat pregame podcast sponsored by Robbins Motor Company. On the other side, we dig into the game with an expert from Mississippi State and my keys to victory on the PowerCat pregame podcast. What are the keys to a Wildcat victory? It's next on the PowerCat pregame podcast presented by Robbins Motor Company. The NFL regular season is wrapping up. But there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same game parlays find bets in the new explore tab make a parlay in the parlay hub the best way to find popular parlays and more so visit fanduel.com slash 247 and make your first bet a layup fanduel official partner of the nfl must be 21 plus and present in Arizona, Colorado, Connecticut, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, permitted parishes only, Massachusetts, Maryland, Michigan, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, or Wyoming. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text Next Step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700 or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland. Visit 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia or call one 800 522 4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800 327 for 24 7 support in Massachusetts or call 1 877 8 Hope NY or text Hope NY in New York or visit oasas.ny.gov slash gambling. Standard text messaging rates apply. Sports betting is void in Georgia, Hawaii, Utah, and other states where prohibited. Welcome back to the PowerCat pregame podcast. And now it's time to break down the game between the Wildcats and Mississippi State. Welcome back to the PowerCat pregame podcast as we look at the cats and dogs as they get ready to fight on Saturday. A little tussle in Starkville. This segment is brought to you by Robbins Motor Company. At Robbins Motor Company, they strive to earn lifetime business and build relationships, selling quality cars, trucks, vans, and SUVs, and offering top-notch parts and service. Robbins Motor Company, title sponsor of the Powercat Pregame Podcast. 
Now we are joined from the heart of Mississippi, Paul Jones, co-publisher of Mississippi State's 24-7 sports site. You're going to wonder if I can get a grip on K-State. No, and I can't get one on Mississippi State right now. I can't get a read on them, where they're at compared to last year. Give me your thoughts. Uh, simple forms, offense is better, defense is not. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and the overriding theme, especially with the defense, are those, um, you know, some guys aren't aren't that big of a factor, but, you know, those 10 guys that are suspended for eight games this year, and the crazy thing is, is we only know a handful of them because they only release the ones that are on the 2D depth chart each game. Uh, we don't know, you know, they have a choice of when to suspend them as far as which game. Uh, we don't get notified of that until pregame on Saturday. But, mm. you know, it's, it's some it's some big hitters in there for them. Willie Gay, linebacker, uh, defensive lineman, Lee Autry, defensive back, Marcus Murphy. Uh, so far, Murphy has not played this year, nor has Willie Gay. But Autry played last week against Southern Miss. Uh, will he play this week? Uh, you know, that's that's up for debate. And, you know, he's at a position, Tim, where it's, it's crucial because not only did they lose Jeffrey Simmons early to the pros last year, they lost five other interior defensive linemen that Ouch. were seniors. Ouch. So, Altry is a senior. He's the only one with any experience from last year. Uh, so obviously that that speaks for itself. And the next guy on the depth chart or in the starting lineup classification are redshirt freshmen. Mm. So there's a huge drop off there in inexperience. Uh, in fact, they have moved James Jackson. Now, now this is an old school football uh, reminds you, but James Jackson has now played at center and defensive tackle this year already in two games. <laughs> and and the word is he's moving back to defense this week for Kansas State. So, uh, man, it, it's been a uh, – I guess we look forward to each pregame on Saturday about an hour before because that's when we know who's playing. <laughs> what a game of chess they have to play. I mean, you've got eight SEC games. I guess the logical thing would be just to sit these guys out, at least the key players, during the uh, four non-conference games. Abilene Christian comes in between the 11th and 12th games of the season. Mm-hmm. But then again, I guess we'll find out what they think of Kansas State if they go ahead and play someone. I don't know who then you set them out for in the SEC because it's the yeah, SEC. It's, it's difficult. And, yeah. and, 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 of course, you know, this is college football, so you're going to have injuries. Yeah. And, you know, that, that plays a factor. And, and that, that was the reason why James Jackson moved to center again last week because the starter, Darrell Williams, was questionable. But uh, he ended up playing the whole first half. And most of the third quarter in Southern Miss, and then James came in and, and went the rest of the way at center. But, uh, you know, that's where I knew it was going to hurt their depth because you're naive if you think injuries are not going to play a role in your season. I mean, that's just as common as who the starting quarterback is each year, you know. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, all that said about defense, Tim, the offense has, has really picked it up a notch this year, and I think a lot of it has to do with the passing of, of Tony Stevens and, giving them more of a balanced look on offense. 29 of 43, 41, four TDs, 72.5% completion rate. That's throwing it around the yard a little bit. But he did get that shoulder dinged. It looks like he's going to be okay. Any concerns there? You know, I think that's that's another thing, Tim, that's going to come down to a game-time situation. I think it's all going to come down to how Tommy feels on Saturday morning when he gets up and goes through pregame stuff. Uh, I'd be shocked if he practices much this yeah. week. Uh, and the word I got was he did not practice yesterday. So he's going to get treatment all week. And, uh, you know, nothing being confirmed. Obviously, you're not going to get an official injury report. But uh, the sources that I've heard from is, is that it was a, a mild second-degree shoulder sprain. Uh, just a matter of getting some rest and getting treatment. Uh, you know, there there could even be a situation where he doesn't start but ends up playing some on Saturday. But if I had to guess, uh, I'm pretty. Uh, I feel confident that he will play Saturday, but uh, just not confident to say he'll start and go the All whole right. way. I want to protect him. So far, Kansas State hasn't hit many quarterbacks, so that might be a good thing. But again, then again, they've been pretty conservative on defense through those first two games. They didn't really need to show much. 
They will have to worry about Kylan Hill. Holy cow. He chewed up K-State's defense last year, so K-Staters are very familiar with him. But he's 41 carries on 320 yards and two TDs. He's averaging just under eight yards per carry. He got better, and K-State fans don't want to hear that because he's better than what they saw last year, and he was really good in Manhattan. How important is he? You can make a case, and, and obviously I just mentioned how important Stevens has been for their turnaround this year, but you know, you can make a case that Kyle is the MVP and, and the guy that stirs the drink. He is better this year. He's in better shape. He, he seems to be stronger, quicker. All those cliches you hear of the offseason, I think he took to heart, and, and he's done that. Uh, Kyle has, has really dedicated himself to wanting to be that guy. You know, he, he had a decent year last year, probably would have got a 1,000 yards had he not been injured in two or three games where he had to sit out. But uh, he still wasn't the bell cow last year. As Williams started some games, too, and it was more of a rotation type of situation and running back. And, of course, you had Nick Fitzgerald, who took mm-hmm. twice as many run, running attempts as any running back did last year. But, uh, you know, uh, to his credit, man, he's uh, he's worked hard to get the position he's in right now. Uh, of course, uh, that depth is is behind him isn't isn't it quite as good. Uh, Nick Gibson, uh, he's a pretty good second string tailback, but he's questionable for this weekend. Man. Uh, I think he's got an ankle injury, and then the guy behind him is a true freshman, Lee Witherspoon, who just got his first collegiate action last week in Southern Miss. Uh, defensively, you talked about the front of that defense having some question marks, but there's some strength on the back end, particularly Cameron Dantzler. This cornerback is really good. He can just take away one of your receivers in a game, can he? He can, and, 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 the, and the guy beside him is very underrated, too, Maurice Smitherman. And they've got a couple of true freshmen playing good at corner. Also got Tyler Williams in there, sophomore. Their, their back end is pretty steady. That was expected to be the strong suit coming into the year. Uh, again, the, the linebackers are, you know, they've got some good guys there with Errol Thompson and Leo Lewis, but uh, Willie Gage probably your most athletic linebacker. And like we said, he, he has not played this year, and, and he's uh, likely one of those suspended for eight games. But, you know, knowing what they know about Kansas State this year, Tim, I'm sure this may be the first game where we see a lot of a lot of secondary members um, getting involved in the mm-hmm. run game and, and, you know, safety blitzes, corner right. blitzes, what have you. They're going to need run support from that group this week. Yeah, K-State does run the ball very well. Shockingly well, considering Kansas State had no returning scholarship running backs and the new staff had to really rebuild that position with some grad transfers and playing some freshmen. It's been impressive to see so far this season. The Bulldogs beat Louisiana 38-28, Southern Miss 38-15. Some consistency there for the offense. And Joe Moorhead now is 10-5 and overall in Starkville. Went 4-4 four and four last year in the SEC. How is Coach Moorhead perceived right now after that 4-4 four and four season? I think fans are still in wait-and-see mode. I think, uh, by and large, fans were disappointed in last year's season. Uh, they felt like that could have been a, a year to win 10 or, or possibly 11 games. Uh, many expected them to, to be the second-tier team in the SEC West behind Alabama. But, you know, they dropped late touchdown passes against Iowa in the bowl game and did the same against Florida early in the season. And, uh, you know, that could have got them to 10 wins if they make a catch here or there. But uh, it's obviously the, the offense was the problem last year. Yeah. And, you know, Morehead came in here with a very good offensive background and, and considered an offensive guru. And it just didn't play out last year. Uh, you know, I think many people point to Nick Fitzgerald just simply not being a fit for the offense. Right. And he was a very inconsistent passer, as you saw in Manhattan last year. But, you know, whether or not that was fully the case, we'll probably get that answer by the end of the year. Uh, but right now, with the way Tommy Stevens is throwing the ball and balancing the offense, I'd say that uh, the people were probably right on cue last year when they looked at the the main factor of the offense and and those struggles. If memory serves me right, you left Manhattan last year and then lost to Kentucky and Florida and got off to that dreadful start in the SEC. Next week, you got Kentucky coming to town. Is there any concern that the focus, not only being an SEC game, but a revenge game might not be on Kansas State as much as it should be? Uh, You know, I think there was a chance of that. But I think the way Kansas State has opened, especially the dominant way that they they've imposed their will on the ground, and that being Mississippi State's weakness right now, 
Uh, you know, I, I think, too, it's a – with the suspensions and the lack of depth that they have, it's, it's, <laughs> it is truly a, a game-by-game situation. Yeah. I don't think – this group can be afforded to look ahead, even if they were playing Abilene Christian next week. That's true. I don't think, I mean, you know, or playing them this week and had Alabama the following week. I don't think this team with the shape that the program's in, I mean, look, we're talking college football here where you have 85 scholarships, and more times than not, you're going to be red shirt and probably double digit guys. And you take 10 more guys away from that depth chart, that's a huge hit when that's you're right. in Power Five football. And, uh, it's strictly a game by game case with them, and I would not want to be in those staff meetings when it comes down to, like you mentioned earlier, picking and choosing who to play who against who. Well, as I look through the schedule, if you've got to have a, an SEC West schedule, this is about as good as you can expect. I mean, you do get Kentucky, which has had some good seasons, but might be down a little bit this year, and then you go to Tennessee, and what's going on in Knoxville? I don't know. Exactly. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> You've got some key games in Starkville. You got the two breaks this season with the double buys. So um, maybe the Bulldogs will. I'm a big believer in Joe Moorhead. I, I know what he did at Fordham, and uh, you know I had always had an eye on what was going on at Penn State because James Franklin came through Kansas State on uh, the Ron uh-huh. Prince staff. So I, I've kind of followed this closely. So I think it's an intriguing hire. I think it's intriguing that the ESPN game on Saturday at 11 a.m. is two former FCS coaches who were very prominent at that level who have moved up to Power 5 level. I think that might show a blueprint for other athletic directors out there looking for coaches. Exactly. And, you know, Moorhead spoke earlier this week of of, of crossing paths with Chris earlier in uh, his coaching career. I believe it was – trying to remember what stop it was he, he ran into him at. But he had nothing but good stuff to say about Chris and, and the brilliant mind he is. But, you know, I, I think people need to be patient with Moorhead. He did walk into a outstanding situation last year on the defensive side of the ball. But uh, he just didn't have his quarterback and his wide receivers uh, to where he needs to be competitive and be consistent. Um, you know, I think they've recruited recruited well since they've been here. Uh, maybe a small uptick from what we saw from Dan Mullen. Uh, of course, that uh, still a lot left to be seen mm-hmm. there because, you know, his first recruiting class was, was just as much Mullins as it was Moorhead. You know how that works when a coach comes in in December. Yep. Um, and then, you know, the last two years, or, or the 19 class, which we've already seen nine two freshmen play from that group and, and a couple of Juco guys. But, you know, that class was a very good class and, and, and they're already impacting this season. And, they're off to a pretty good start uh, with the 20 class. But, you know, I think with Moorhead, it, yes, he inherited some NFL players on defense, but he also inherited a roster that had been mismanaged at the wide receiver and the defensive line standpoint. Yeah. Because anytime, anytime you go from losing five or six seniors on the interior of the line and you only have one senior and five or six redshirt freshmen, well, that, that shows nothing, but you ignore that position for a couple of years, yep. you know, and, and, it, and it came back to bite them this year. The same thing with wide receiver. Uh, they ignore that position for a couple of years. They made some progress getting some guys. Obviously, Isaiah Zuber is one of them in the, in the grad transfer team, but uh, they have improved that position this year. Well, that's good. I'm looking forward to this game, as, a, as are a lot of people around the country, because let's be honest, it's a – stinky weekend of college football we'll see what happens on saturday in starkville that's paul jones the co-publisher of mississippi state's 24 7 sports site paul i appreciate you joining us today anytime man Uh, look forward to seeing you guys here this weekend and uh always appreciate working with you guys it's a k-state sports tradition it's fitz's five keys to victory on the powercat pregame podcast presented by robbins motor company And now it's time for my five keys to victory. The full pregame analysis of my keys is for VIP customers of GoPowerCat as premium content. But let's do a quick rundown right now. The Chris Kleiman era of K-State football roared to that 2-0 start with a pair of dominating wins over lesser competition. But a much more substantive test awaits Saturday in Starkville, Mississippi. It's K-State versus Mississippi State, the 23rd ranked team in the nation. It's the Big 12 versus the SEC. It's a giant opportunity for Kleiman's program to plant its flag as a team worth watching. 
What is K-State's path to success in this game? Well, here are my keys to the game. Key number one, capture Kylan Hill. The Bulldogs featured running back took apart K-State last season and is looking like an even better player this season. Hill breaks tackles and averages almost eight yards per carry. Find him, contain him, and get him on the ground. Key number two, keep being good, Skylar Thompson. The Wildcats junior quarterback has been in complete command, but those were home games against lesser competition. Mississippi State's defense will be dramatically better, and Thompson needs to lift his game to match. Use play action to your benefit. When the dogs are looking run, hit a tight end or running back that the defense forgot. Key number three, play in the backfield. K-State's defense has one sack in two games. It's time for the Wildcats to crank up the pressure. Win that line of scrimmage, and whether it's a pass or run, make the play in the backfield. Key number four, be patient with the run. Mississippi State's front four is a rebuilt group, but it's still an SEC defense. Running the ball will be a far greater challenge against the Bulldogs, but keep rotating the backs and keep fresh bodies on the field, and then the fourth quarter should be yours. And key number five, be clean. Don't mess up special teams. Don't turn the ball over. Don't get overly penalized. It's not rocket science here. Don't beat yourself. If the Wildcats don't make mistakes, they may leave with a victory. Two weeks ago, there was no way I would have considered picking K-State a winner in this game, let alone actually doing it. Now I've seen both teams play, and the perceived gap between these programs isn't much of one at all. There's something about this team and this coaching staff, something special. My prediction is K-State 24, Mississippi State 20. Well, that will do it for this edition of the PowerCat pregame podcast. Our thanks to everyone who joined us on today's podcast. Make sure you join us for our PowerCat postgame podcast. Brian Hanley and myself will gather in the WTC Gig Powered Studios Saturday following the game and discuss what just happened in Starkville. Well, the Chris Kleiman era of Kansas State football is about to face its first big challenge, and we will have complete coverage of the game in Starkville at GoPowerCat.com. And there's no better place to enjoy the rise of K-State football than as a subscriber to Go Powercat. Grab 30% off an annual sub right now so you don't miss a moment of our award-winning coverage of your cats. I'm publisher Tim Fitzgerald, and the coverage and podcasts do not stop at GPC. I will talk to you right after the game. You've been listening to the PowerCat pregame podcast presented by Robbins Motor Company. PowerCat podcast, all rights reserved, gopowercat.com and Spirit Street Publishing.